Welcome to the Old Soul, New Soul Astrology Podcast. Thomas Miller along with Robert Glasscock. Going to ask today a question of Robert about the Equal House System. This was one of our very first episodes. One of the early episodes is establishing what house system Robert uses and why. And this is it. Equal Houses. So I'd refer you back to one of those first episodes, one of the first couple, three, if you would like to catch why he particularly uses this system. But what it does, and he'll explain this in answering this question, is that it can move the midheaven to the ninth house, or depending on the degree of the ascendant, it might be in the tenth house. And I know you might be kind of saying, huh, wait a minute, but isn't the midheaven, that's our career, that's the cusp of the tenth house, and that represents our reflection out or our shining out into the world? Isn't that all how we're supposed to assimilate the midheaven? And I've even seen, Robert, I've seen some people actually get upset about this. To the point that they even, I can tell, they're like, they're grumpy about it. <laughs> and they kind of don't know what to do with a midheaven that's not in the midheaven, 10th house. But maybe even right there is kind of the break in the pattern because our, should we separate 10th house and midheaven? And I'm guessing because of the structure of the equal house system that the answer to that is yes. Yes, absolutely. In equal houses, the ascendant establishes the degree. And it's also the first house sign. And then that same degree is placed on each successive sign all around the wheel. So the 10th cusp in equal houses, the 10th cusp is not the same thing as the midheaven. The midheaven in equal houses becomes another point. And in your case, it falls in the ninth house. Sometimes it falls in the 10th. My midheaven falls in my 10th house in equal houses. So, yeah, in when you're using equal houses, the midheaven is not the tenth cusp. The tenth cusp is the same degree as on the ascendant. It's just the sign in square to that ascendant. That's all. Now, interpretively, I, to, the old interpretation, I guess, holds up to some extent. My midheaven falls in my tenth house. It falls on the tenth house side of my tenth equal house cusp. So, in effect, that midheaven opens up my ninth house. It expands it. It pushes the midheaven pushes into the tenth house a little bit. In your chart, it's the opposite. The midheaven is in your ninth house, and so it, in effect foreshortens your ninth house and opens up your tenth house. It's quite the opposite of mine, really. Now, generally with someone like you, where the midheaven falls in the ninth house and opens up, symbolically opens up the tenth house, it can indicate the type of person who is very eager to get out into the world and in a career identity. And I mean from very young. Uh, and yes, they'll get higher education to the point that they need it, but that's it. Couldn't they, wait to get out of school, couldn't wait yeah. to get started. Yeah. And so with someone like me, where the midheaven falls in the ninth house, you could say, well, this guy never leaves academia, but that's not true. I didn't particularly, I got all the college I wanted, but the truth is I am to this day still learning. I never stop, but that's true for a lot of people, you know, so I don't know how, but that's the classic kind of indication of these midheaven. I don't think it really matters that much in interpretation, except maybe in that general sense, because I don't know that I had a career sense to tell you that all I knew was I wanted to be an actor. Well, that that's a pretty vague career because that can be anything. Uh, but once I got into astrology after a few years, you know, and was publishing, I realized, my gosh, I've got a career. I'm an astrologer. Just like that guy said, I had no intention of being, but look at this, I am. And so you begin to accept it, you know, in a way. So I don't know, these, these, this midheaven, uh, well, let's 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 play with this for let's play with this for a second because I've got okay we can use this in my chart and Robert's chart both we'll put in the show notes so you can reference these, but here mine is at seven thirty eight so almost eight not quite eight it was about when I was fifteen that I surrendered to be a Baptist minister and I was going to go to seminary and do my work as a pastor Pisces midheaven seven degrees fifteen years old. Exactly like you were saying, couldn't wait to get started, knew what my career path was. Well, in the last episode, we talked about all that pivoting. And then when I went into secular work and started doing television production and all of this, I always felt like something was missing and that my work wasn't counting for, 
you know, that eternal spirituality of reflection in both the ninth house, Pisces, and Neptune, which, of course, is conjunct my son. So there's the whole thread of that discontent. And then when I found my path now, where every day I get to come in this box and talk about astrology and metaphysics and wonderful things and about spirituality, I'm as happy as a clam. <laughs> You know, I was thinking about something else with this chart. You had mentioned your Uranus at 20 degrees, 44 minutes earlier in the, around that age. You can multiply that by two, and you get 41 and a half around in there. And that would have been another big, significant age where that Uranus archetype would tend to dominate your life. And it's another age of awakening on an even still greater level than you did back in 2021. Yeah, that was the tee-up of the second marriage, which, of course, led to the shift and everything. So, yeah, exactly. Okay, so you just, like we did right there, you just read it back into the ninth house that some of the characteristics of that ninth house are going to play out. Yeah, I mean, back even in the old books, reading about this fact using equal houses, and I said, well, okay, I can see where, in your case, the midheaven might foreshorten a higher education. So you never went for a PhD. Neither did I, and I have a much larger ninth house. My midheaven falls over in the tenth, so I have a big ninth house. But I didn't get a college degree and didn't want one. I went to my junior year and very deliberately dropped out, as I told you and my, my dad at the time, oh, please, son, stay and get your degree. You'll... You have it one more year and you'll have it to fall back on. And I just said, Dad, that's why I don't want it. If I have it, I'll fall back on it. I know myself and I don't want that kind of life. So I very deliberately denied myself of ever pursuing a job that required a degree. And I did that at 20. And it's, it may sound immature, and it probably was really in a practical sense. But for me, it worked out magnificently. And it's certainly not that I haven't had challenges, because I have. But it still has worked out incredibly. And this is all due to astrology, Thomas, because I had no clear clue what the hell to do with my life back then. And this suddenly started speaking to me, oh, look at this, look at these house matters, look at this talent, look at this thing about money, look at this. And it suddenly gave me a framework that was understandable and made sense. And that, so I, I truly, I sit here at this age marveling because I am grateful to the all that is for bringing astrology to me and vice versa. Well, and the so what we're talking about here, of course, is separating the midheaven from the 10th house. So maybe some of you have come up through Placidus, which most of us have and did, or maybe you're a student now of the whole house system, the whole sign house system that is becoming more popularized through traditional astrology. And so you're thinking that the midheaven and the 10th house are directly correlated. And I guess the lesson of this is to separate them and read that midheaven right where it is. Play it as where it lies, right? It's like, yeah. if it's there, then it's there for a reason. Well, and the basic foundation of all this, back in the days, Placidus, for example, what they did, what astronomers, astrologers did, was to calculate the, the midheaven, the, the point directly overhead. And then they would calculate the ascendant. And then they divided that arc by three to get these different house cusps. And the whole modus, motive for trying these various house systems was to get ever more accurate horoscopes. And by ever more accurate, in those days, much simpler lives, much fewer options. Astrologers may have been employed by the king, the queen, and the palace. So their job was to make predictions about wars and births of babies and all that stuff. So you'd better be right. Uh, so they were looking to be more accurate and more accurate about physical events. They were not psychologically oriented. They were medically oriented. Hippocrates used astrology. So that goes back that far. They were medically oriented, but it's still a primitive form of it. So then gradually, you had Reggie Montanus and Porphyry and all these different astronomer astrologers trying different house systems when, in fact, to me, the equal house archetype 
is metaphysically truer. Because I kept reading in books, oh, well, you know, if you're an Eskimo living in Alaska, so far north of the equator, well, your life is completely different than if you live, you know, in, in Egypt on the equator. And I'm thinking, how is it different? It's hotter or colder, but money is money. I don't care whether you're trading whale blubber or dollar bills, it's still money. And Eskimos don't live any differently in relationship to money than we do. It's just a different form of money, maybe. But in fact, they don't live any differently. They have groups. They have 11th houses, just like we do, no matter where we And so on. And I kept thinking, this search for ever more accurate, more fatalistic astrology is kind of pointless in a way. Because it doesn't jive, it doesn't jive with the reality. All of these houses in the equal house system have equal importance. They're the same size. So there's no artificial focus on one or the other in some kind of attempt to make a more fatalistic chart. It's it's archetypally, to me, a more accurate representation of reality. We have these 12 different areas which encompass everything, from money and clothing to health to pets to lovers to mates to careers, anything. And those areas are distributed to me ideally through the equal house system because it's the ascendant the rising sign and degree that sets the stamp for everything else to me that makes more logical sense than any other house if i didn't use equal houses i would use coke so that's just kind of my logic but to me the only way and it i learned it the way same way you have to try these houses if you like hold signs use it And I also remind everybody, we all have three horoscopes. Most people forget this. You have a timed birth horoscope with a time from a birth certificate. That's one thing. You have a solar chart, which is to simply take your birth chart, but place the sun on the ascendant and read that chart. And you also have a natural wheel, which starts with zero Aries. Place your birth planets in the natural wheel and read it because you'll find out still more information about yourself. So the truth is we all have these three charts. Now, the time birth chart, of course, is the most reliable and accurate, but believe me, you'll get valuable information from these other two kinds of charts. Well, we've gotten valuable information from these last podcasts. Thank you so much for this, and we will separate the midheaven in our mind from here on. (laughs) I promise. (laughs) Thanks, Robert. Really appreciate it. And we appreciate you listening. And you know what? We have a whole community in our Discord group. Go to the funastrology.com website. I'm not telling you what to do for you Aquarians and Uranians, but I'm just saying it's there (laughs) if you'd like to check it out. Funastrology.com up at the top are some social media icons, and that Discord one is the one on the right. And if you click on that, Kristen Lawhead runs a group over there that is just doing a great job of man they're answering questions and reading charts and everybody loves to contribute and there are several hundred people in there that are active in that conversation so if you'd like to continue past here she picks it up and rides on to the next wave and that's on our discord group thank you so much for listening we'll see you next time on the old soul new soul astrology podcast with robert glasscock